I received a note yesterday. Uh, Dear Brother Jabe, I enjoy listening to Fireside Friday and Mini Message Monday. Very encouraging. And it's signed by Nathan Castleberry. He works at Bible Truth Publishers in Addison, Illinois, and uh, he had sent a package of materials sent by my friend Rob from Michigan for me to distribute. These are the beautiful gospel calendars, uh, which we will be distributing across Mississippi in the next few weeks. So included in the package, there was a gospel tract, a sample tract, the Bible Truth Publishers, if you're interested, either in their gospel calendars or gospel tracks, and they actually have little business card size calendars to give away, you might be interested in contacting them. BibleTruthPublishers.com probably the easiest way to get a hold of them. As I was looking over this little tract, I began to think, you know, I tell stories on a regular basis. What's the point, right? Well, Jesus told stories. He thought they were very valuable as truth communicators. They are an effective way of softening people's opposition to hearing the truth. It's kind of like the raspberry jam that helps the medicine go down. And so he used them both in instructing believers and in speaking to the lost, sharing the gospel. And I do most of this with you to encourage God's people, but we should remember that good stories are excellent ways to communicate the gospel. And I'm just going to read you this little track. This is from Bible Truth Publishers. It's called One Word Prevents Suicide. And it tells the story of Tsar Nicholas, the leader of Russia, in order to find out what was really going on with his army, used to wander through his military camps, dressed as an ordinary officer. Late one night, when all the lights were supposed to be out, the Tsar was making one of these tours of inspection. He noticed a light under the paymaster's door, and quietly opening it, he stepped inside, intending to have the offender punished. A young officer, son of an old friend of the Tsar, was seated at a table, his head resting on his arms, sound asleep. The Tsar stepped over to awaken him, but noticed a loaded revolver, a small pile of money, and a sheet of paper with a pen that had fallen from the hand of the sleeping man. The Tsar read what had just been written, and in a moment he understood the situation. On the sheet of paper was a long list of debts, gambling, and similar debts. The total ran into many thousands. The officer had used army funds to pay reckless debts, and now, having worked till late into the night, trying to get his accounts straight, he had discovered for the first time how much he owed. It was hopeless. The pitifully small balance on hand left such a huge deficit to be made up. On the sheet of paper, below the terrible total, he had written this question, Who can pay this great debt? Unable to face the disgrace, the officer had intended to shoot himself, but exhausted, he had fallen asleep. As the Tsar realized what had happened, his first thought was to have the man immediately arrested and court-martialed. Justice must be done in the army. But he remembered the long friendship with the young officer's father, and love overcame judgment. He quickly came up with a plan to be just toward the army, and yet justify the culprit. The Tsar took up the pen that had dropped from the hand of the wearied, hopeless offender, and he answered the question with one word, Nicholas. The Tsar himself could pay that debt and voluntarily chose to do it. The young officer woke up soon after the Tsar had gone and reaching for his revolver to blow out his brains. But as he did, his eye caught the answer to his question. In bewilderment, he gazed at that one word, Nicholas. Surely such an answer was impossible. 
he had some papers in his possession which bore the genuine signature of the Tsar, and quickly he compared the names. To his intense joy and humiliation, he realized that his Tsar knew all about the debt. And yet, instead of inflicting the penalty he deserved, the Tsar paid the debt himself. Joyfully and peacefully, he lay down to rest, and early the next morning, bags of money arrived from the Tsar, sufficient to pay the last ruble of so great a debt. You and I, the author concludes, have a mighty debt. We might say, who can pay it? Thank God, love has provided an answer. And like the answer given by the Tsar, it's only one word long. Jesus. Yes, Jesus knows all about your debt. He knows how great it is. He knows how you came by it. He knows all the shame of it. He knows the cost of payment, and in spite of such intimate knowledge of you and it, he has assumed the full liability of it himself. One word, Nicholas, set the heart of that young man at rest, he even filled it with joy. One word, Jesus, has set my heart at rest and filled it with joy. Has that one word, that one name, filled your heart with rest, peace, and joy? It can. And then the tract concludes with just the ideal verse. Listen to this. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things. Acts 13, 38 and 39. Realize that stories have this wonderful way of connecting with people where they see themselves in the picture and where they hear the story as a kind of ricochet. The truth doesn't come directly to them. It comes through the story and so it makes it just a little easier to accept. And the Lord knew this, and good tract writers do this too, so that the best tracts are not a story with some verses stuck on the end. People say, okay, stop telling the story, and now they're going to preach at me. No, the ideal tract, like this one, or like uh, the matchless pearl, when you get to the end, you already know the punchline. The story itself has transferred the truth to your heart without you hardly noticing it. And so God help you. We should be leaving tracks wherever we go. People get out of the use of these and say, well, what good are they? Because a lot of them get thrown away. Yes, but every once in a while you meet someone who is saved through a gospel track and they know the value of tracks. And never forget riding with William McDonald one time in Oakland, California. And up on the hillside was this massive structure the Mormons had built, a Mormon temple. And I said with disgust, look at that thing up there. And Bill said, I'm glad they build those things. Oh, why? I said. He said, they don't put the money into literature. <laughs> and you know, that's the point, that gospel literature is seed. And sometimes the seed is choked, and sometimes it's stolen, and sometimes it withers, but sometimes it produces 30, 60, and 100 fold. God bless you. Remember BibleTruthPublishers.com. You're familiar with Gospel Folio Press, other places that you can get good gospel tracts, good news publishers. Get some and use them. And may God increase your harvest, the harvest for the Lord Jesus. <music>